So I walked away from a 20-year career in IT, like a C-level C-level IT career that I spent my whole life building, killed it to go all in on real estate. This is a story about a dude named Lane. He moved to the mainland and bought one place to stay. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one real investor man. Hey, Simple Pastor Cash Flow listeners. Today, I got Agustino Pintos, uh, one of my partners of mine, and we are going to uh, get to know him a little bit better. How's it going? Oh, man, I'm awesome. Psyched up to be here. How you doing, man? Good, good. Hit that uh, subscribe pillow and uh, mash that button. Hit the bell, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know what? I should get the bell up here. That's what I should do. Yeah, so a lot of you guys um, don't know what you're talking about. We, we do this on YouTube, and we throw it up on there, so... I'll, Pretty much all my content today is found on the podcast. It's also found on YouTube. I'd say more stuff on YouTube these days. But um, yeah, let's get to know you a little bit better. Augustina, how much simple passive cash flow are you making today? And how are you doing that? You know, right now, everything's invested in real estate. So I just do multifamily real estate currently. I'm all in on multifamily. So uh, to that end, everything that we get, everything that pretty much passively comes in is usually poured directly back into the business, right? So whether it be in terms of earnest money, whether it be in terms of uh, just putting, you know, eating my own dog food, so to speak, put it into the deal itself. So really, I mean, aside from a couple hundred grand, that's pretty much it. And after all that, I pour everything right back into the business. So it's uh, right now we're in growth mode, you know, and, and that's all I'm focused on at this point. I mean, I had uh, Mike Michalowicz on the podcast recently. He wrote the book, um, profit first and yeah i was telling him it's like yeah i mean we, we don't really take a profit we've just put it right back in equity and the deals and hopefully the magic happens <laughs> that's well, that's that's it that's it that's it you know i mean the thing is though is that we've we've done a lot of deals uh i know that we're, we're doing right right now and we're really really good at picking the right deals and uh, we're very very careful with how we underwrite and how we get in on it so uh i would say that i it's less about hope and more about we know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> At least I like to think we do anyway. <laughs> At what point did you um, kind of come to this more abundance mindset side where you felt like you had enough money to put food on the table and, and you didn't have to worry about paying the bills with a salary? Yeah, man, you know, well, a part of it is that with, with my journey, the way I did it was I used to have the corporate America job. I used to be a CIO, a chief information officer, of publicly traded companies. I, I did all that. And it wasn't until, and I was also doing single family too at the time, right? Long, like I've been doing six, like single family, small multifamily for 16 years. But I would say about uh, going on four years ago, decided, you know what? Uh, multifamily is where it is. A friend of mine told me about multifamily and this is what I need to be doing. So when I decided to transition from this single family, small multifamily to doing big multifamily. That's when first, I, that's where the spark went off is that I made, I decided that's what I'm going to be doing. And I gave myself a timeline. I gave myself a, a, you know, basically a goal to say that on this day, I'm going to be, I guess, I'm going to take on my last consulting gig. I'm going to focus on just building up the, the, the business while working at a regular consulting gig and uh, packed up everything, moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm at right now, and really got to work on building, working as a consultant and building this, this multifamily real estate business. And true to form, just like I set out in my goals that I, that I write every day religiously, I set up my goals to really define what I'm gonna, how I'm gonna live my life that far off, that's what I do. But uh, I decided that that within uh, within I think it was it was a twelve month period from making that decision. You know, I hustled, man. I hustled hard. <laughs> That's what it took to get there. So people always like to kind of understand. You know, wh where were you in that situation where you finally made it? You know, say I was going to go from single family to multifamily and more as an operator than yeah, as sure. a passive investor. But like, how long were you doing the single family homes? How how big was your portfolio at that point? So you decided, yeah. and then how did the the day job overlay on top of this? You know, were you kind of still working the the, the day job while doing the multifamily? Kind of t explain the the timelines how they. Sure, overlay. sure, sure. You know, I actually started single family. God, 
16 years ago, maybe a little longer when I was working at a company in Virginia. And I was a CIO, I was making great money. And the reason why I got into multifamily or single family at the time, a small multifamily was just to, to be a backup in case something happened with my job. That was the only reason why I did it. You know, it wasn't about, uh, it wasn't about building legacy wealth. It wasn't about trying to build something big. It's all about in case something happens, I'm going to have some extra income, right? Uh, so I started focusing on single family, small multifamily, and, and really try to build that portfolio up. I think by the time I finished up, by the time I left Virginia, that, you know, about uh, four years in when I started all that, I might have had like small portfolio, like under, under 100 units, like it, it would it would fluctuate between 80 to 100. And, uh, you know, nothing crazy. Um, but then it was, um, I, I, but I, then I, I, I pretty much kept it pretty, pretty flat for many years. Uh, just had some things going on in my life at that point. And, you know, especially with 2008 backed away from, from all that. Uh, but I would say that the last job that I had brought me back to Virginia. I started selling off all my assets and I was talking to a friend of mine. And he was a real estate attorney. This is again going on about four years ago. He says, uh, I said to him, I go, hey, how who who buys these big properties? Who how's it how's it done? And he explained multifamily syndication to me. So once I understood how it works and what it takes to to really put a deal together, I'm like, oh, I could do that. I, I work in corporate America. I'm, I'm not afraid of the numbers, I'm not afraid to do the hard work. So that's exactly what I did. I just put myself I, I, I just got committed to studying every single thing I could find on multifamily syndication, syndicating deals overall, and got myself in front of some great mentors, got myself in front of some, some great people that helped me build the business. And that's really what it took. You know, it's, uh, I'm not going to say by any stretch it was easy, uh, but you know what? It was totally, totally worth it, 100% worth it. You know, now I'm all in on this real estate. I'm all in on it, 100% on it. At what point did you quit the day job in there? Was that oh, so so that was that? Yeah, so that was uh, I quit the consulting gig, the one I mentioned earlier. God, it's been uh, three years, you know, three years ago. And you know, I'll tell you what, Lane, I'm not going to say it's all sunshine and rainbows every single day of uh, my life these days. You know, hey, there's there's everyone's got a bad day. Everyone, we, sometimes we face some pretty bad stuff. But there's not a single day I would ever, I would never, I would never even think about going back to that. <laughs> just, I just don't. I just don't even think about it. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with how how we're growing the business. I'm very pleased to partner up, especially with people like you, uh, to really, to really build something that's really cool. You know, and we've got some cool stuff in the pipeline here that is just awesome. And uh, you only get to do that and build those opportunities when you really commit yourself wholeheartedly to, to a project. It's the only way to get it done. So a lot of the guys listening, they're still in their day jobs, um, or maybe they're even having started investing yet. If you can kind of go back to your single family home days, um, we call this the Han Solo moment. It's like, you know, Star Wars, Han Solo and his buddy Chewbacca were just low life smugglers. And then they found <laughs> Luke and Leia, you know, it could be the right people or the right idea. And then their their life took that pivot point for you. What was yeah. that pivot point, or if there's some kind of story from your corporate days that you can be like, that was the moment that changed my path. Well, you know what it was. It was it happened a couple of times, but it didn't. It, it's funny how it didn't click. You know, till till uh, the second time really. The first time when I was working as a CIO as a young, you know, 30, 30 something year old guy working at this publicly traded company running global technology in my early 30s is ridiculous, right? It's crazy uh, managing these multi-million dollar budgets. And I, you know, like I said, I started doing the single family thing. And when, when things got, when, when the company decided that they're going to make a change, even though the company was doing great, uh, I, I was performing very well. My team was doing great. We were, we were keeping it as IT. So we kept all the systems up and running. We we're innovating the company decided we're going to make a change. So they come up to you and they say, pack up your stuff, get lost. You're done. Now I had focused everything. I put my whole heart and soul into that company, right? Like any good C-level executive or any executive for that matter, pretty much anybody listening should be doing. If you're working for a company you're, you're going all in on that company, it's what you're doing. Right. 
Uh, but what I did not do to my own detriment was really focus on building that passive income on my own for my own self and for my family. That's where I, I, I did not do that correctly. You know, I should have, I should not have relied on the, these, uh, these outside forces to really take care of me and my family like I did. You know, that's, that's what, that's what killed, that's what killed me right there, you know, and, and allowing that to happen. Not once, but twice. The second time though, was, was the time I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to do this ever again. I'm never doing this again. I'm not going to put myself into the, into a predicament like this. And that's why I decided that real estate was it because despite all the problems I had over the 16 years that I've been doing this, from going to job to job to job, trying to hold my head above water with these different companies, that real estate kept on throwing off money every month, every quarter, every year. I'm not going to say that it was always like, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year coming in from real estate. I'm not saying that it was just passive income, but that's one thing is for certain is that that money came in, you know, and that's, that's the thing I realized. I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing the corporate thing anymore. I mean, I might do one last gig. I'm going to do a consulting gig and I'm just going to go all in on real estate. So I walked away from a 20 year career in it, like a C level, C level IT career that I spent my whole life building, killed it to go all in on real estate. So, I mean, take some, uh, take some courage to do something like that. <laughs> so the uh, first time they told you to get lost, yeah. they told you to pack up. You didn't have any, anything in your portfolio at that time then. I had like some single families and some small multifamily. That's okay. it. Well, you at know, least you had so. the, you had the, kind of the proof of concept at that point, right? Yeah. 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 Well, that's exactly it. Yeah. Because even though, and that's the thing though, it's like they, so they riffed me, I'm at home with this giant house, the giant mortgage and these car payments. And I'm like, Oh man, what am I going to do now? I mean, fortunately I still had some, some money coming in, you know, to support me, but that's, that, that's the power of the passive income, you know, is that money kept on coming in. Right. And help kept me above water, thankfully, because if I hadn't done that, if I had discovered the power of real estate, Man, it'd be a different different life story. We tell you today. I'll tell you yeah. that. <laughs> so, so at that time, how did your portfolio take the next step in the next like month or two after? It, well, anything changed like after that? After that fire got lit under your butt? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, well, that's the thing though too. It, it, unlike some other people you might have had on your show, for me, it was I, I didn't add anything new. Right. I was because at that point in my life, my mindset was, was not was not set properly. Right. I was still thinking like an employee. Right. I was still thinking like an employee. Again, nothing wrong with thinking like an employee. But other than the fact that, oh, my God, I need to get a job. I got to get a job like right now. I got to send out resumes right now. Hurry, hurry, hurry. You know, so even though I was an entrepreneur I've been, as, a, as a kid, that's all I ever wanted to be was an entrepreneur. I, I, I put that aside so I could be an employee, right? So I, I think that the fire didn't happen until later, you know, until that, until more recently when I decided that, that you know, after getting fired from yet another job, I was like, you know, I'm not doing this anymore. That, uh, that, really, that really kicked off me doing this thing wholeheartedly, 100% all in, you know? So I think that that early on, it, 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 I don't think I was ready, you know? It, it was one of those things that, that I'm sure you might have heard. I think it's an old proverb. It says something like, when, when the student is ready, the teacher shall, shall appear. And I think at that point, I wasn't ready to be taught. You know, I wasn't ready. I was still in the mindset of an employee. I wasn't doing self-improvement. I wasn't reading books the way I'm reading books today. I wasn't doing any of these things that any successful entrepreneur should be doing, you know, to really be successful. I wasn't doing that, you know, to my own detriment. I needed to be doing that stuff. I do it today. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things that I just wasn't doing before, you know. So let's kind of talk about this, um, this topic of, you know, where do you go LP or GP? You know, you've got a few rental properties, you've got some experience under your belt, but, you know, you start to realize that after having five, eight, 10 single family homes, it's just not scalable. It's not going to get yeah. any substantial passive cash flow coming in every month. Um, you've you're, you're, you're obviously a success story, but I'm sure like myself, you've seen a whole bunch of guys fail at this. Um, oh yeah. Any comments <laughs> on like the percentage of people that try to take the next step and what is it 
if you can talk about like, you know, people are trying to make this decision on their own in their head, right? Yeah. As they work their 100, 200K job on the side too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, I'll tell you what, Lane. I mean, I, to for many, many people, there's guys out there on the internet. They're putting up these courses. Hey, $4,000. I'll teach you everything you need to know. Do it. Sign up now. Man, I tell you. I mean, hey, listen, we have a program. Uh, happy to sell it. However, what you don't see is the amount of work that goes into finding and putting together a deal. That's <laughs> it's an obscene amount of work. And uh, we might go through at least 100 deals before you find one right? One that actually pencils out and has, shows a glimmer of hope that it could be something that you could invest in and get a nice return to hit the targets that we establish, right? Not including all the, the, the relationships you have to build with the brokers. It's, that's, that in itself is a full-time job, calling on brokers. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Got any deals for me? Hey, buddy, how you doing? Continuously making phone calls, talking to brokers. That's, we, that's how we find our deals anyway. We get our deals primarily through broker, broker relationships, right? Then of course, vendor relationships, right? And maintaining those relationships, uh, maintaining relationships with our lenders as well and, and the lender brokers too. I mean, I've already talked to, to my lender broker uh, four times this morning on a variety of different deals. We're refinancing three deals right now, you know? So it's like all that, everything I just mentioned is a full-time job. So as an executive, as a C-level executive, or hell, any executive for that matter, even, even if I'm working at a company as a developer, I don't know how I would do that and also try to do what I'm doing today. It's, uh, it'd be extraordinarily hard. That's kind of the reason why we, what I would do anyway, if I were in that predicament, is just partner up with with a good solid operator that knows what they're doing, they have a great team and they know how to underwrite deals. They know that, that the deal they're putting together, they, they know the reasons why it's a great deal and go all in on that. I mean, in reality, they get equity in the deal, they get, they get a return, they get all the tax benefits. Uh, it's not a bad gig, you know, it's not a bad gig at all for, for an LP. And you probably see a whole bunch of these guys just like I, how I do like the dreamers. Oh, and yeah. I just, I just want to highlight what you said there. Like, obviously you have to work hard and everybody knows that. And these guys will like, yeah, but I'm not, I'm special. You know, I, I work really hard. I'm like, <laughs> all right, dude, you don't even have a college degree. Like, I mean, not saying that that's important, but you know, that's why I like working. One of my criteria is that you are an, a professional, right? Yeah. And yeah. not saying that college is worth anything. I'm actually kind of against the whole traditional educational system, but it shows a level of commitment that, you know, most people come into this. What's that? What's that, um, that movie with the, the flying dog, never ending story or something like that. <laughs> like he goes to like the thing and it zaps him with the lasers. Like you're not worthy. You're not worthy. Yeah. A lot of people just are just going to get zapped with the lasers. And yeah. I think what you said there, like you have to work, your butt off but you also have to like have these special skills of like navigating key relationships with brokers lenders etc partners oh man that's what I, these hard workers cannot well, do they can't do it man i mean listen i i don't want to sound like you know i get down on people that that don't have the work but i mean yeah i meet them i meet them at, uh, at different events and they say they want to become a syndicator and they don't dress the part they don't act the part. They don't say the right words. They can't spell N O I. Uh, they don't, it's, and I'm not saying that uh, that it's you know this is uh, how should I say you have to it's ex exclusive little club or anything else like that. It requires a great deal of effort. That's all I'm saying. It's like it, it's it's and it's very hard to convey over a podcast. Uh, or, or it's, it's just, it's just difficult to, to, to convey that way. But Dude, I, tell I, you, it's, I stopped, I mean, you going, know, you know, I stopped you know. going to real estate conferences because I find the other guys, the guys who listen to like thousands of hours of podcasts and they, they tell me things I don't know about this weird calculation of some NOI thing or I'm like, Oh, all right, man. Like, you know, the academics. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I know yeah. all about that. Augustine. You know, like. <laughs> 
let me yeah, tell yeah, you. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> How many deals have you done? You know, and, but then you ask your buddy and you're like, yeah, that guy hasn't done jack, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. And they dress the part too, right? <laughs> there was one. So one of my students, he actually went to a seminar and someone, the headliner at the seminar actually said to a group of 200 people, fake it until you make it. And I'm like, oh my God, no, man. Listen, I, you know, guys like us, we have a fiduciary responsibility, right? That's, that is key. We have a responsibility to our investors. We have a responsibility to our families. We have a responsibility to the people that invest with us as well, personally, like friends and family, aside from, aside from other investors too. And to everyone else that is relying on that project's success, right? There's no time for fake it until you make it. Right when you have, when you're when you're messing with other people's livelihoods, there is no faking. My opinion, <laughs> that's just what I think. You know, it, it, it's like I, I I would never ever say that, and I would never recommend to someone fake it until you make it. It's more like study, learn, understand how how to put this deal together, partner up with someone that knows what they're talking about, work with them, get to know them. I mean, it's a long, long, long journey. This this was not something in my case anyway happened overnight it took it took me 16 years right it took me 16 years to become an overnight success right it's that's how it is in this business in my opinion anyway yeah i mean and, and then also like you can't do this while you're working a full-time job no no no, no like you can't. Maybe, maybe pick up your first a small apartment building but yeah you know i yeah it ain't gonna work it's just yeah, not yeah, possible yeah. i mean it, it might be possible to get like say a 30 unit um, you know, hand it over to third party management and you'll probably get, they'll probably steal from you is what they'll do more than likely. And, and what I mean by that is, is that because you're focused on your job, like you should be, it's going to be very difficult to also watch all the expenses on, on this third party and what they're doing. Right. And how do you negotiate that contract too, by the way, right? If you're doing 30 units, you're starting off 30 units. That means you're paying 10%. We're not paying anywhere near 10% right? For our, for the management of our assets. But what they'll do is they'll cut you a break. You know what? Just for you, Lane, I'll do it for you for five. And you're like, wow, cool. Okay. But then they start, start fluffing it in with all this extra stuff. You know, oh, we took a trip, <laughs> replaced the door lock, painted a room. It didn't need to be painted. And, and they'll find ways to get their money out of you, right? And having those relationships, like I said earlier, it's like, that's another vendor relationship. You got to keep a close eye on what money gets spent right? What money gets spent on, on what assets? And you notice, for instance, we do this all the time in our office, two assets side by side, two different locations. How much are we spending on a unit turn over here versus over here? Why is this one less than this one? What's going on? Let's have a call. Let's figure it out, right? Are, is it two different vendors too. Maybe they take this vendor and put them over here, right? As well, right? Different things like that. It takes time to run those analysis and know how to really figure out how to do that kind of stuff. If you have 30 units, it's very hard to find someone that's going to care. And that's, that's, that's probably the biggest issue, you know, with the, some of the smaller deals anyway. Yeah. I've, I've kind of found that you really need to be above 80 or hundred units. I mean, yeah. everybody talks about, and see, so this is another one of those things, these podcasts, like groupies, the, the, the book groupies, they know these rules like, Oh, you need to be over 50, 60 units to get a property manager in the office. But oh. in real life, <laughs> you need that person and the handyman. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. And even 56 units, depending on where it is, uh, I don't know if that's feasible, honestly. It's more like 100, in my opinion, is probably the minimum. But yeah, man, I mean, now, nothing wrong with, say, starting off with 30 units and two months later buying another 56 units and two months later, you know, if you want to do it that way, I suppose you can do it that way as well. If someone really, really wants to do this on their own. But man, I can't, I can't even imagine working on an office job and trying to run that number of units, three different properties uh, by yourself, like keep it as an asset manager. That's hard, man. That's hard work. It's hard work for, for, for what, like, what is the overall goal? You know, if the goal is to get that passive income, difficult to do, man. That's, that's, that's tough work. That's tough work. If you've been following my journey, I've been selling my initial real property and transitioning into syndication deals lately for a more purely passive investment strategy. One critical part of my portfolio is the American Home Preservation Fund, or what folks in the Hui call AHP for short. 
George Newberry, once apartment owner, operator, and mentor to me, is now sponsoring the podcast. His private fund, which by the way also accepts non-accredited investors, cuts the middlemen out and allows you to invest directly with him to fight the mortgage crisis in America. Join him by purchasing distressed mortgages while getting a double-digit annual return paid monthly. Find something else better out there? Well, let me know. Feel good knowing that you are helping families stay in their home after buying their underwater note at a huge discount. Invest as little as $100 by going to ahpservicing.com slash investors. And if you want the free Burn Zone book, please send me an email at lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. I like to buy stuff. Well, that's a liability. So we're in this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis where uh, it's just another day at the office for folks like you and me, but right. but I know you're, you can't go out as much. What are um, a, like a two week experiment that you're kind of tinkering on or a six and a six month project you're working on? You know? you know, I don't have a six month one, but I do have a, a year one. So back in December, I created a list, a book list, right? Of all the books I'm going to read for 2020. I created a list. It's on a sheet. And then I have a checkbox and I check, check off every single one I've read. So a book a week, basically, right? I got a, got a hold of all the books, put them all on my phone. Right now I'm reading the autobiography of Albert Einstein. And uh, yeah, it's a very interesting guy, but the books are mainly consist of autobiographies of, for people that overcame some really hard times. And you'd be amazed at the hard times that Albert Einstein had as a, as a young scientist, but uh, what, what it took to overcome something, uh, we listen to a lot of, or I listen to a lot of stuff on sales and marketing as well, social media marketing, and um, also on, on sales, you know, so it's, it's those things that, that, that pretty much make up the book list, right? And uh, much of my, my real estate stuff is all made up of, I do listen to some real estate, but most of it is just by networking, masterminds, things like that. That's how I, that's how I engage that through real life problems and resolving them so yeah that's definitely a lot of fun but yeah i mean try reading a book a week that'll change your life i promise you that'll change anybody's life it's good stuff man i tell you it's awesome any kind of like personal like two-week project something uh you know taking in the daily routine or something like that you know uh trying to work out at home so so far since all this stuff happened I can't go to the gym anymore. I can't go to CrossFit, right? Which is what I was, which is what I usually do. So now I'm having this so far, this is what week two of this, <laughs> this, this COVID-19 thing. So now it's all about working out at home. And uh, I tell you, man, it's, it's tougher to do at home than it is to work out at the gym with, with a group of, uh, of other motivated individuals. It's, it's tough, but uh, yeah, we'll make it. I'll get, yeah. I'll get through it. <laughs> I, do, I do CrossFit too. And then like yesterday I, I got bumper, pl- bumper plates at home. I got my patio, but I was just, I just put in like 135, which is like nothing. And I just deadlifted it like 10 times. I was like, that was boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's easier to do when other people are around. Right. It's, yeah. That's the thing, you know, it's, I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's kind of like there's other people there and uh, there's just more energy in the room. I think that's what it is. I yeah. It's total accountability. It yeah. I was thinking about getting the the mirror or the bike thing, the Peloton or Eklon. I don't know what it's called. Yeah, the Peloton, Peloton. Yeah, yeah but yeah, they Peloton. told me that the bike, there's so many orders for the bike that it's not going to be here till like May or June. Right. By then, this thing well, should be over. By yeah. Now, I yeah. Expect. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's got to get over soon, sooner than yeah. later, I would imagine. Yeah, for sure. We're, for we're sure. just lucky it's not the Spanish flu. Then all the CrossFitters would be dead. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who don't know the spanish flu went after like there was it, the stronger your immune system the more like it attacks yourself something like that oh really yeah. i had no idea all yeah, right so all like the young guys who are like super fit they all died oh, <laughs> wow all right man <laughs> um what is your simple passive cash flow number that you're shooting for these days what what is that for you well, something per month you know per month you know what it's like what we did my wife and i we we basically cut our expenses 
early on anyway. We cut all of our expenses so we can just focus on building the business. So part of it is, is the sacrifice. And you've got to keep in mind, you know, I'm the guy that had the corporate America job making bank at the huge house with the granite countertops and cathedral ceilings. I had three cars, I had a Corvette, I had a Hummer, I had Mustang convertibles, I had all this stuff, right? Got rid of it all to focus on building the business, right? So back then it was, uh, it was only like 10 grand a month. You know, it cut out everything. Everything was cut out, right? So it, it really wasn't that much. And, um, you know, and any money that we get is all thrown back into the business over and above that number. You know, that's, that's basically how we did it. You know, it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. You know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not a big number when you think about it. Cause by the time you th think about it, you know, the government's going to steal half of it, right. You know, taxes. And then, uh, then you, you have to live off the rest, you know, cover your expenses. So not much, you know, not much at all. Yeah, and a lot of it is like equity that you kind of roll into the next one and the next yeah. one. Um, yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, what's your what does your your wife say when you kind of just say, "Hey, it's it's going to work. Just give me four to six years. The magic will happen. You know, you'll see it. <laughs> or your start your life will start to change." You know, is, that, is that kind of which a, a daily uh, discussion or <laughs> no, no, no? You know, I I I am I'm very 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 lucky that. My wife, I, I met her before, before really I got into all this stuff, like as a, like on a full-time gig, the way I'm doing it now. So she, she knows me, she knows the story, she knows uh, my personality. And she often tells me, she goes, I have no doubt, I have 100% certainty that you are going to do exactly what you say you're going to do. She has n zero doubt. She believes in me 100%. She's on board, you know, so... Uh, I, I am extraordinarily lucky that my wife is on board. She believes in me. She believes in what we're doing. She's, she sees it already. I mean, it isn't like she's, it's all like, you know, pipe dream stuff. You know, I tell her I'm closing this deal on this day. Boom. It happens. She's, and she's, she's not even surprised anymore. <laughs> she quit being surprised a long time ago. Right. But uh, yeah, it's um, having a spouse, especially in this business, that will support you is extraordinarily hard. You know, it's uh, cause yeah, I mean, I've, my, my friends that are in this business that are like top performers. I that's one common trait is that their, their spouse at home supports them hundred percent. I'm happy to say that my spouse is in the same boat. You know, it's awesome. It really is. It's great. It's great. Yeah. I have the uh, reluctant spouse guide on my website guys simple com slash spouse it's not a joke it's for real <laughs> no i no i know it's real no no i get it i get it yeah what, what do you guys do when you close a big deal with anything special is there some kind of sushi man sushi that's it <laughs> just sushi <laughs> <laughs> it's like a little celebratory thing uh when my when my other partner comes into town uh it's usually uh vegan food you know he's a vegan uh, I'm vegetarian, so it works out great, you know, and uh, it's, that's our little celebratory thing, you know, that's, uh, but yeah, with, with, with the wife anyway, yeah, we, we have to, we always celebrate something, we, and we celebrate in a very small way, it's, uh, it's you know, sushi, something very small, we don't, um, for, for right now, for the time being, we are very, very careful with how we, we, we spend money, not necessarily invest, we, we do invest our money, but how we spend our money on things like that, we're very, very careful with how we how we do things. You know, we're not reckless or careless or anything else like that. You know, it's uh, very important that, that we we spend money where where it needs to be spent properly. You know, for us anyway, it's how we do it. Yeah, that's how we do it. That said, what is something you recently bought or thinking about burning your cash on for uh, <laughs> well, time savings or improvement of quality of life? Well, you know what doing this stuff is, is a real big deal for, for us. You know, it's like we have the Bulletproof Cashflow podcast that we do, right? And uh, I, I upgraded the camera. I got a new camera coming in. It was like uh, 200, 200 bucks. Oh, Nothing dude, crazy, is that the right? Logitech one? <laughs> but if anything, it's going to help get our word out there. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's actually, it's, it's a used camera, man. It's oh, okay. Like, it's a used one. It's a, it's a used Canon T3i, you know? Wow. 
So uh, yeah, we're gonna hook that up and we have, we have a whole bunch of new equipment coming in just to really improve the audio and video, right? But um, like I said, yes, yeah, we're just very, very careful with how we invest. Not only do we invest our money outside properly, other people's money, we invest our own money very carefully as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because yeah, those those Logitech guys they barely send out our emails, but they sent out this like new 4K camera. Yeah, the Brio. Yeah, I saw yeah, that. the Brio. I bought yeah. it. Well, not the Brio. The Brio's for the Windows one, but this one's for the Mac. It's like oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So that one is. Uh, I don't. I don't want to geek out in front of uh, <laughs> in front of your audience, <laughs> but yeah, the the, the Brio. The Brio is, is, is it's supposed to be a really good camera. It's a 4K yeah. camera. Really yeah. Good. So people can see like. The, the crusties I have in my eye for waking up super early. <laughs> I mean, that's not the best thing. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You want to zoom in and, and check you out. There we go. <laughs> yeah, not too, not too close. But yeah, if you're on the YouTube channel, you can check that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, something that you recently changed your mind on, because often ego gets in the way of greatness. And I see a lot of people, they just have some messed up thoughts. And I'm like, all right, okay, sounds good, dude. You know? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, I wouldn't say it's recent, but I, I'll say that it's it's uh, something that changed my life when I realized it. So back when I was an executive at, uh, you know, working as a CIO, I thought that all it took was for me to do a good job and keep the technology up and running. And if I do that, I'll get paid and everybody will be happy. Systems are up. I'm innovating, everybody's getting paid, what can go wrong, right? And th then they hand me the box, right? At the end of it all. The, that was wrong, that's incorrect, totally wrong. The way that it's supposed to be, then the one thing I did not do is I did not network with the people that worked at the company. I it pretty much kept to myself. I focused on, I got there early, worked my ass off, stayed there till late. You know, I was putting in 12, 13 hours a day at this company, right? And, uh, you know, I was working hard for them. That's what, I, that's what I was supposed to do, right? And I still got handed the, the, the box. Now, and meanwhile, there's guys there that are still working at the company that were, were known to be somewhat of questionable character. They're still working there. Why? They took the time to network with the other executives and uh, they and they they went to all the meetings. They went to all of the the, uh, the the conferences and things like that to getting to get really engaged with the community with the community of the business and also the community outside of the business that, that really connects with other people in that in that space. Like in that case, it was, it was finance, right? So other people in the finance in the finance world knew of the company and knew of that individual made them worth more money, right? It's, it's kind of like the same thing that we do, Lane. You know, it's the same thing. I mean, we got to do the same thing. We're getting out there. We're building our personal brands. We're getting out there. We're building uh, our businesses. It's the same sort of thing. You can't come out of nowhere and expect to buy a 200-unit property if nobody knows who you are and what you're about. You know, it takes time to build that. You know, it takes time. So uh, that's – but anyway, I was totally wrong about that. You know, now – this business is all about partnerships. This business is all about delivering value to other people in a way that you're giving someone everything you can. You're, you're giving your partners everything you can, you know, everything, you know, and, uh, and that's, that's how I operate anyway. I, give, I, I do everything I can for my partners to try to make things easy for them, knowing that in one way, shape, or form, it's all going to come back. That's how I do business. So, yeah. Yeah, it's... Um... I mean, you can see it in your investors, right? Like I know, like a lot of my guys are engineers. So, you know, it's the typical person is, if they're under a million dollars net worth, they've kind of saved their way up to that, like yeah. 700, 800,000. And they're a total like, like developer type or person in their compute, in their cubicle, not really expanding outwards. Where the guys who are a million and a half, $2 million net worth and above, Obviously, they're already investing, yeah. but they're the ones they got out of the engineering role and more into the sales engineering role, is what I'm saying. That's right. That's right. Well, hey, listen, you can never, ever, ever save your way to prosperity. 
it has never worked. It never will work. The only way you can do, you can be wealthy is to invest. That's the only way. It's the only way to make it happen. It, it just it's just kind of interesting that the, it's kind of coupled where the guy who has that mindset where I'm just gonna keep pounding away at what I'm doing, not talking to anybody, is also the guy not investing their stuff yeah. outside of Wall Street type of instruments. That's right. That's right. That's 100 percent true. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Right. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm yeah. working away. Invest in my 401k and everything. Yeah, they told me to do. Oh yeah. Oh man, I was doing all that stuff too. I was putting all my money in this 401k thing. I, I was doing everything that I was told to do. Everything I was, I went to school. I got two master's degrees. I, I, I was a good CIO. I went, went to corporate America and then they hand me the box. I'm like, well, wait a second. I did everything I was supposed to do, wasn't I? No, <laughs> I was not. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was saying, man, I'll never go to that place ever again, man. It's not happening. No yeah. way. Yeah. No way. And, and so likewise with doctors, right? Like I don't, most doctors who aren't investing, their net worth would really never get above one to $2 million. Right. But the guys who are, holy crap, they're like four and a half, ten million $10 million. Yeah. It's yeah. night well, my, and day. My, my one partner, she's uh, she's a young doctor and uh, she's a partner on, on one of my deals. And uh, she's been able to blow up her, her net worth tremendously, not just on that deal, but she has the mindset that you had just said, you know, she's, she's investing in other deals as well, right. To help grow her net worth. She's going to be very, very successful. She's in her early thirties. She's making great money already as a doctor and she's blowing up her net worth even more. So yeah, she's doing great, but it's the same thing. You know, she's, she's focused on putting money aside, you know? So in this uh, seller's market and, you know, we're kind of in the middle of a crisis and I'm sure it will go away here in the next few months or whatnot. Um, what should people be focusing on investing in? Oh, wow. The stock market is where it's at, man. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were kind of serious because people will say that. And I'm like, all right, man. <laughs> It's ridiculous, man. I, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, and I used to do that, you know, as a young kid when I was, when I didn't know any better about real estate or anything else like that. I was, I would sit at the, I sit at my at my office, and you know, when the boss wasn't looking, try to do some day trading and all this other nonsense. Man, that's ridiculous. It's it's crazy. I mean, think of it like this, right? My so I had a friend of mine. He he was gonna he was gonna throw like two hundred thousand dollars at some stock or something, and I'm like. Why don't you throw down on a deal, man? Throw down on a deal. It's like, oh, I don't understand the real estate business, yada, yada, yada. So I'll put it to you this way. All right. It is, at that time, it was May the 1st, right? Uh, I said, May 1st, great. What's your stock, what's, what's your stock going to be worth on May 30th? He's like, well, I don't know. I said, I can tell you how much money is going to come in on May 30th from my rentals. I know because I have legal contracts <laughs> called leases with all my tenants that say they're going to pay me every month. That money comes in, right? It's predictable. You're building up equity in a cash flowing asset. You could force appreciation on this asset. You get all it. you get, then you also get depreciation on the asset too. I mean, you can't do that with a stock. You just can't do that. I mean, it's, uh, if you, if you were, and I told my buddy this too, it's like, you go to Bank of America right now, see if they'll give you a loan to go buy their stock. And they won't even do that because they don't even believe in their own company enough. <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy. You know, it's crazy. But it's, it, to me, it's, it's like, it's like uh, gambling. It's like gambling at a casino, you know, because you don't know for sure what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Whereas with real estate, uh, even during this crisis right now, I mean, we're still buying. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll look, I'm looking at assets now, you know. And uh, the thing is, though, is that at the end of this, this crisis, it's, it's not going to matter. The asset is still going to be there. It's still going to throw off cash flow. And we know what it's going to do because it's very predictable. People, no matter what you do in Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, everyone needs a place to live no matter what. They don't need an office. They don't need a piece of paper. There's a stock on it what they do need is a home, right? And that's what we do. We give people homes. And this is, uh, that's why it's like, especially this, the kind of stuff that we're doing, it's, uh, it makes total sense to do it. We're not worried about it. You know, that's what they should be investing. If people need to be investing in real estate, they should have been investing in real estate all yeah. I mean, obviously you kind of know, you can put it on a model and you can kind of tell from deal to deal, but for somebody sitting at home who doesn't have 
a network nor has any kind of underwriting experience what anything that they should kind of stay away from in the world of real estate at this time oh yeah i mean it's you know what uh d class assets th- those are the, probably the the ones that are pushed the most all over all over the place i mean especially not to, not to, not to bash on loopnet but loopnet unfortunately has uh has a lot of this this bad inventory and what i mean by that is there's the promise of the super high cap rate, you know, I'll give you a 15% cap rate. Oh my God, the cap rate, the cap rate, the cap rate doesn't really matter all that much. It's not the cap rate. It's the margin you're looking for, right? The cost of money versus the cost of, of running the asset. You know, what's the difference? That's what you're looking for. Cap rate is important. I'm not saying it's not important, right? But what I am saying is that People are getting out there pushing this, these super high cap rates. And when then that person goes and buys that deal, which is usually in a D-class area, they get burned. And now they're stuck with a, with a non-performing asset because everybody was, uh, was just heads on beds. They just, the, the previous owner, or the, pre- the seller rather, just put a whole bunch of people in there, drive the occupancy up, unload the property and got rid of them all. Happens a lot, especially in D-class assets. You know, it's a very CD type of business. Stay away from those places. You know, just don't do those, just, especially if you're out of state, don't do that. You know, I personally stay away from it. Some people specialize in that stuff, all the power to you. Go ahead and do that. Uh, For anyone that's in this business, even as a a limited partner, stay away from D-class assets. Invest with a good operator that knows what they're doing with C's and B's and A's, that that knows how to run a proper asset and make sure that it performs. That's the best way to build great wealth and still enjoy all the benefits that come with managing and running a multifamily asset. I mean, for a passive investor in that way, it works out super. You know, they get all the, they get, they get the benefits without taking on any of the risk, really. It's very low risk. It's very low risk for an LP. Yeah, we're kind of looking at um, getting away from the Class C stuff, which is probably what you're talking about. You yeah. know, like cl- you're saying your Class D, but for me, it might be a class C or definitely what a, what a broker would call that class D or yeah. class C. Cause they're always trying to make it sound better than it really is, but yeah, 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 just not worth it. I mean, those are the guys who get hammered the most in this, in any kind of weakness. I mean, they get fired first and they don't have any savings too. That's right. They, they live hand to mouth. They uh, typically have uh, salaries that are hovering, well, usually at $30,000, probably even less than that. Uh, you know, absolute poverty, you stay away from those places. You know, it's just not worth the hassle. Never buy cheap real estate. There's a reason why it's, it's, it's cheap. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's nothing that you really want to be investing in. You just don't want to be investing in stuff like that. You know, it's, it's, it's not worth the hassle. It's not worth the risk. It just isn't, it just isn't worth it. All right. And to wrap things up, the last Close out question is the Tony Robbins question of the art of fulfillment and the science of achievement. So uh, first, what is your uh, secret or hack to the science of achievement? Any kind of rituals or things that you found lately that has helped you be more productive? Get well, things done? yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, um, getting up early in the morning, going to CrossFit first thing, you know, early, like, you know, you're waking up at like five o'clock in the morning to go to CrossFit for six. And then by the time we come home, the world is still pretty much asleep at that point, or at least I'm not on the phone anyway. I sit down and I write out my, my journal and then I write out my goals, right? I write just one page of the journal, one page of the goals. Like what, what, how did yesterday go and how's my tomorrow gonna be, right? And when I say tomorrow, I don't mean just like daily goals. I'm saying like, what is my life going to look like? And I write these goals as it's already happened, right? And that's important because I'm programming my subconscious to look for those things to build success, you know? And I often do that too. If, you know, if the day doesn't go my way, I'm writing in my journal, I'm writing in my, my goal sheets, I'm, I'm preparing a new one, you know, just to keep me on, on target. But, you know, that's that in itself that function going working out my body and then working out my mind and then i'm ready for the day that has made all the difference in the world that has changed my life that those those two things you know it's 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 
and I'm sure you hear about it. Everyone talks about it on their, on these podcasts maybe, or read about it in books. And you might think it's all foo-foo nonsense. Uh, I promise you that stuff, it works hundred percent. It's, it's amazing. It's a life changer, absolute life changer. And what is your secret or hack to the art of fulfillment? Any way you contribute back or um, how do you kind of keep things in perspective? <sighs> wow. Uh, you know, the, the, so one of the things that I wanted to do in my journal was that I write about is I, I, I do want to help the children of Cleveland, right? So in December, and I've already, I actually wrote it down in my, in my, in my goal sheet, like what I plan on doing charity wise to uh, much of what it's funny. You brought up uh, Tony Robbins, you know, how he started his charity, uh, Thanksgiving charity, right? Um, I want to do the same sort of thing. So what I'm doing is, and I write it down in my goal sheet, I write it down. I want to help these kids. I want to help these kids. So part of what I'm doing is, of course, from, for building wealth for myself, building wealth for my family, my investors, I'm setting aside resources so I can do just that. You know, I'm not in a place where I can do it yet, but it's going to happen hopefully this year, right? And with that in mind, that's how it, it gives me something to work, work for. You know, it gives me something to look forward to as well, because I do get joy just by helping some other people and I'm not expecting anything back. You know, that's how I do things. I just don't expect anything back. I just want to give as much as I can and, uh, you know, and help hopefully help out these, these people and make a difference in someone's, someone's world. You know, that's uh, that in itself means a lot. So that's, that's how I do it. That's how I do it. Awesome. Um, yeah. So we're something I'm trying to do on my side is, trying to get more involved in donors choose if you've heard of that website you can kind of mm -hmm. donate to um teachers who have like elementary or, or high school projects and i have i'm getting going to get ready to launch that to my group but i want control over what projects we give to more financial education type as opposed to like interpretive dance or building a canoe kind of a project <laughs> <laughs> I don't have control, you know. Man, I tell you, no, I, I love it because I, I you know, that's, that's exactly what I want. What I want to do with with these kids and you know here in Cleveland is that it's, it's probably the same journey that you've been on, same one that I've been on. You know what, Lane? You you go to school, you 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 get a job, and that's it. You go put your money in a four hundred one k, you get old and you die, and that's how you're going to be, and then you're gonna, you're expected to be happy that way. Uh, that is not a way to live a, a life to your full potential, you know, in my opinion. I mean, that's not my, my full potential anyway. And, uh, and, and throughout all that, the one thing that we're not taught in school, in grade school, high school, college is wealth, wealth building. We're not taught that, you know, we're not taught that. At least I wasn't, you know, I had to learn it on my own. I have to learn it afterwards with mentors, you know, and that's, that's huge. You know, I love that idea, man. It's a great idea. You know, build tied into some sort of some sort of mentorship program, maybe, or or some way to some way to, to really introduce finance and, and financial intelligence to, to some of these kids would just be awesome. No, it's, it's remarkable. Interpretive dance is not going to get you a job. Just it just won't. Well, a different kind of job, but not the job you want. Yeah, yeah, making pot. Right. right. Pots. Oh, pots. Yeah, pots. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you want to get your contact information. People want to get a hold of you, and we'll put this all in the um, the show notes. If you guys go to simplepassivecashflow dot com, absolutely, time. absolutely. No, if they if they message me at info at bulletproof cash flow, uh, you can find me on on Facebook. I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. Friend me on LinkedIn too, uh, and of course on Facebook as well. Follow me on Instagram. We're all over the place. Very just just Google bulletproof cash flow. You'll find me. You'll find me. All right, man. Uh, well, I guess I'll probably see you shooting emails out to me and screwing around in the Dropbox when I'm still up at night and you're getting going in the day. No, I know yeah. what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the 